Welcome Wargamers to the last day of Seraphon Week. Today we'll be taking a step back from the literal units and talking about the various beasts and monsters that make up this army. It is one of the most visually striking aspects of the faction, and I would be remiss if we didn't dive into them. So we're going to kick off the discussion talking about Croxagores. And these dudes, like everything else we're going to talk about, is just a living siege weapon. And if you look at them, they're almost kind of this missing link between Seraphon and the rest of the beasts that they ride. We mentioned that cold ones are kind of similar to Seraphon in terms of just being reptilian, aggressive, hate chaos, those kinds of things. But these guys are pretty much looking just like Seraphon. However, they do stand almost twice as tall as a Saurus warrior. And they're much more primal. Right, they're incredibly feral. There's this mountain of flesh with a huge club or a saw or a hammer or something like that and just goes knocking at people's door. They're used to destroy fortifications and break well-defended lines of the enemy. And the oldest of the Croxagores is called an Ancient. He's the leader of the unit. He's sort of the directing force to the rest of these hulking behemoths. What's important to note is that Scar Veterans and Old Bloods, who we mentioned are the real leaders and orchestrators of these armies and battles and things like that, really treat these guys with a warrior's respect. They could view them as beasts of burden, mindless monsters, because they are, like I said, so primitive and feral, but they're given that respect because they do resemble and... But they're given that warrior's respect because they really do resemble Seraphon warriors. Next up is the Stegodon, which is a massive living war engine and then this one's an important distinction because while the croxagore is bipedal and kind of moves and functions just like a larger zoomed out version of a seraphon this is when you start getting into the dinosaur region right much like a triceratops they're strong stubborn incredibly powerful and they're often outfitted with a hoodwa like a little uh platform to be ridden on and there's a bunch of skinks in it we talked yesterday about skinks how they use beasts of burden and turn them into weapons well, from the top of one of these guys, they'll be throwing spears, shooting darts, javelins to stab people, and they just kind of bring that wrecking ball straight into the line of the enemy. Now, on occasion, these things will be outfitted with a very mysterious weapon called the Engine of the Gods, which is just a really cool thing. It's like a giant stone mechanism that exudes the power of Azir, that light energy. However, despite this machine being so impressive looking, it has some pretty unpredictable results. It can project an massive power outburst, make a huge explosion on the battlefield, it can energize nearby ally allies, it can energize nearby allies, kind of topping off their energy, reboosting them if you will. But what stands out the most is the fact that they can mess with time itself. They can kind of project this field around them that speeds everything up, so enemies We'll be looking at this and they'll see the Seraphon coming, but then all of a sudden the Seraphon will go like on fast forward mode and all of a sudden they're just in your face. It makes this lumbering savage army lightning fast. Next up are the Bastilodons, my personal favorite of these guys. And these things are tough as nails. They act as a workhorse, basically a gun platform for ancient weapons. Whatever they're hoisting on their back heats up to extreme temperatures. It's literally channeling the power of the stars from the heaven and converting it into a beam of energy. The weapons heat up to like sun levels of energy, but the nice thing is their plates protect them from it. These are the guys with kind of the hardcore shells, just like a giant armadillo, if you will. And it makes them the perfect beast of burden to carry these incredibly powerful, but also destructive weapons on them. However, they're not just a gunboat. They are still a living war engine. And when they start charging, they can use that inertia, those plates, that resilience to go hammering straight through defenses, towers, things like that. Trample over big troops. And then if there's something really big, like an enemy fortification or construct or something like that, they can use that big old tail and crush them with it. Now the next up is the Humble Carnosaur. And I say humble in air quotes there. Uh, they're always being ridden by something, and so we usually see them ridden as a Scar Veteran or an Old Blood. And it's one of the largest beasts that this faction has. It's said that their rows of teeth are like swords to normal men. And they have a favorite tactic, which is you slash with one arm, slash with the other, pin the person down, and go at it with your jaws and just dig in. In that sense, whatever they're attacking, they're always trying to pin down. Now, as they're approaching battle, they can actually smell blood. They have an incredible sense of smell. And when they smell that blood, they are just instantly drawn to it. And it just really puts them into a frenzy, into a fervor to go into battle. It gives out a deafening roar that can terrify the enemy and just plunges headlong in. 
And as I mentioned, these kinds of aspects make them perfect bounce for those leaders who need to be one, up high enough to see what's going on with the battlefield, but also two, apply the right amount of savage destruction in the right areas at the right time. So you'll see them a lot with Scar veterans and Old Bloods. And last up is the Troglodon, which is the chosen mount of Skink Oracles, which we talked about yesterday. However, these beasts are very different from Carnosaurs. They most effectively hunt by sound, which is cool. Put a pin in that. They also have an incredibly acidic saliva. They can just like spit acid at people. But what they do is they walk into a battlefield, they try to figure out where the enemy is and start spitting acid. And when they hit something, whatever they hit will inevitably start screaming. Well, that triggers their instinct to hunt by sound and the Troglodon will just barrel straight at whatever they just hit. Now, of course, these are more beasts of burden. They're really only ever ridden by the Skink Oracle, who is, of course, just to bring it back up, their job is to defend the Seraphon army against magic. But realistically, he's just along for the ride. This is another one of those situations where the beast is already going to do its work and you just put a rider on it to make it more effective. The fact that you have this huge monstrosity barreling straight at the enemy. It doesn't have to go towards a wizard, it just has to bring the oracle close enough to battle to be able to be effective at stopping wizards, which is exactly what they do. If you gotta get close to the enemy to, to unbind their magic, you might as well do it in style and have yourself a huge hulking beast that's spitting acid at people and just tearing them to shreds. Now why are all these monsters so cool? Well, first of all, living war engines are my favorite kind. Right? I remember watching Lord of the Rings when I was a kid and seeing the huge elephants, I think in whatever the second one was. And I just thought it was incredible because they seem so unstoppable when it's like a living thing coming at you. The same goes for Clan Mulder. I had mentioned in my review of Skaven that that was my favorite because there's just something so horrific about that much flesh and muscle just coming at you in a way that, frankly, a tank would. And they form organic weapons of war. And what I love about these and the Seraphon specifically is that they're all about mutual cooperation rather than engineering. They don't subdue these creatures. The creatures were already going to go in and do some massacres on their own. You just put a rider on it to make it better at doing that, to make it more effective. Because the only thing that would kill more enemies than a cold one is a cold one that has a Saurus warrior stabbing people with javelins on the back and biting them and lashing them and all those things. It's just maximizing the natural brutality that's already there. And the savagery and ferocity of these creatures adds a lot to this army. Because the Seraphon really, as we've talked about before this week, focus on intelligence, right? Their intelligence with ferocity. But these beasts, the things that they bring into battle with them, they are all about ferocity, dot dot dot, guided by intelligence, right? The reverse of it. It's ferocity first, being animal, savage first. And it makes them wholly unique to the army and very incredible in combat. And so when you put those things together, this intelligence that leads to fierce battles and then savagery of animals that are led by intelligent creatures, you get this whirlwind of death. Because like I said before in that uh, small book by Gav Thorpe, uh, when the Seraphon land, it is just havoc. Because you got pterodons and Ripperdactyl shredding everything, massive beasts going straight for your face, you got Saurus knights on your flanks. It's just insanity made manifest, and these beasts make that happen. Everything is moving forward at you at full speed, and it's just more visually aggressive than I think cannons are, right? Seeing a bunch of cannons on the hill is terrifying because you know what they can do. I think it's very different if those cannons are, say, mounted on the back of an armor-plated beast that's hurling towards you. That beast might be less accurate, but it's coming for you. It's different. And they really add to the theme of the army. That kind of ancient and uncivilized power feel. But it doesn't really detract from it. It still allows us to have those big pieces that really draw us in, that look great. The models are incredible, and it makes this a full army. The heavy-hitting nature of some of these weapons that these things carry really add a lot to the depths of this army. If it was just Saurus Warriors and Skinks, they really wouldn't be able to handle much on the tabletop, but these guys add that kind of power base. So friends, those are my thoughts on the monsters of Azir, the mounts and creatures of the Seraphon. I had a lot of fun doing this week. I spent more time looking at the Seraphon models than I ever had before, and they are gorgeous, and I've loved reading about them and talking about them. As I mentioned at the top of the week, this is the last week of, uh, for factions, I should say, in specific, uh, in first edition. Next week, I have something incredibly awesome planned for you. You should really tune in. 
you're not going to want to miss it. But above all, I want to thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you in my next Age of Sigmar lore video. Thank you so much for watching, and happy wargaming.